Good morning, church. It's good to be here with you this morning. Luke 11, verse 1, hear the word of God. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you has a friend, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And thus ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. You can have a seat. This is a, a, the second week of a series on mission that we're doing. I, I don't know how many weeks because I'm not in charge, but I was told to do the second week on prayer. And, you know, God's mission is to reveal his glory to the world and to share himself with us through Christ. God is gathering a redeemed people who have their highest joy in being pleased with God, whose greatest treasure is Jesus. And we saw a little bit of that last week in Psalm 67, where we found out that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. And that's true especially of prayer. God's mission doesn't happen without kingdom prayer because that's how he shares himself with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the exaltation of God's name, the fame of the name of Jesus, and the advance of the king's kingdom, and he brings us everlasting fruit. It's, it's really pretty good. And, and of all the things that the apostles needed to learn from Jesus, all that they felt like they wanted to know from him, the one thing, the only thing rec recorded in the Gospels that they asked to be taught is how to pray, not how to preach, not how to work miracles, but how to pray. And that tells me three things, that it's important, that it must be hard, and that Jesus wasn't simply repeating the Lord's prayer as a rote ritual prayer to be followed. So imagine the prayer life of Jesus. Can you just imagine for a second what it was like to watch him pray all night or to find him missing in the morning and go look for him from the camp because he's off praying with the Father? You see, the, these disciples, they're, they're men of prayer. They're, they're, they're already very religious men. Old Testament Judaism was built around set times, set prayers at set times of the day, morning, afternoon, and evening. The, the longest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms, which is a book of prayer. And, and the longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, which is a prayer. So these are religious men who pray every day, but when they encounter the prayer life of Jesus, they realize something's missing in their own life, in their own prayer life. They want more. They want to go deeper. They want something more effective, and they want to be fruitful. It, it's a holy jealousy, I think. They want what he's got. They want to pray like Jesus. So Jesus tells them four things in this passage we read. First, he reviews the disciples' outline for prayer. You, you know, we call this the Lord's Prayer. It really should be called the Disciples' Prayer. 
But first he reviews those seven peti petitions. It's, it's a, a review that, uh, that, that, he, that, that he gave first in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the first time he introduced it, way back when. And so here it's a review of the prayer for them. I'm sure he's told, this, told them this more than once, but like us, they're slow to learn. And so we've covered the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer before. I know that uh, your pastor has preached through them. T today we're looking at the other three things, the command to pray and then the two parables about prayer. So I have three points this morning, three things that I want to share with you about the gospel. It's really simple. The what, the how, and the why of kingdom prayer. So first, the what of kingdom prayer, how to have a lifestyle of prayer. Look again at verse 9. He, Jesus says, and I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I slept through high school English. Anybody with me there? I... I had a subscription in the Cliff Notes. They, they may not be called that anymore. I, I'm a math guy. I'm, I'm an engineer. I put my head down on my desk during English class. So it's God's good humor that I now get to read and write and preach for a living. And I missed all that good stuff. The grammar in verse 9 is really important. Put that verse back up there, would you? There are three imperatives. There are three commands. Ask, seek, and knock. And there are three indicatives that follow each command, three gospel facts, and that's how the gospel works. The commands of Scripture are built on the facts of Scripture. So the first command, Jesus says, ask. Now, why do we ask? Because that's how you receive. It's very simple. Now, the second command, Jesus says, seek. And that's because that's how you find. The third command, Jesus says, knock, and that's how you get through the door. It's really all common sense. Uh, another way to see this is that Jesus commands us to pray because that's how grace, God's grace, is given to us. In, in other words, ask because that's how God gives you his grace. Seek because that's how God reveals to you his grace. And knock because that's how God welcomes you to the fullness of his grace. And the implications of this, beloved, are, are simply incredible. These commands to pray are given without reservation, without exceptions, without rebuttal, without reproach. God doesn't say to you, don't ask me, go ask your mother. He, he says, ask. In, in, in fact, the apostle James says, you have not because you ask not. If there's any boundary at all here to the command to pray, it's simply the Lord's Prayer. In other words, the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer teach us the boundaries of God's uh, desire for us to pray. It's the subject matters of our prayers as we ask seek and knock. Now there's seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. You can put them up. The first one is our Father, which is about the pleasure of gospel sonship through adoption. The second one is to the, uh, uh, the worship and the union of holiness and praying for the fame of the name of Jesus. The third command for the kingdom is about evangelism and mission. The fourth petition is uh, about obedience that's revealed in love and mercy and justice, praying that we would accept and approve the will of God. The, the fifth command is about generous bread, praying that we would be content and satisfied and thankful and have a life of simplicity so that we can be generous. The, the sixth command is about reconciliation and forgiveness, and that's got to be the hardest thing, and it requires the most prayer because Jesus mentions it twice in Matthew 6. And then the seventh prayer is spiritual warfare. It's about temptation and trials and perseverance. So God promises to answer these prayers. So what does he do? Well, he commands us to pray so that we won't miss out 
on his promises. And, and we pray first the kingdom petitions of the Father's business, and then we pray for our own business. That's the outline of the prayer. That's what kingdom prayer is about. Now, a second point about grammar Hebrew, Hebrew poetry and preaching often comes in two-part parallels. Two-part parallels. I, I, I identified that with a math guy, as a math guy because we're talking about parallels. It had to be good. Two-part parallels. Now, a two-line parallel sayings are constant within the Bible. You'll find them throughout the scriptures. The second line clarifies the first, and that really helps you to get a better understanding of what you're reading. And so Jesus does that here in verses 9 and 10. Jesus commands us to ask in verse 9 because God will give us grace in the future. And then in verse 10, Jesus says to keep asking because it's a participle. Because God already is giving us grace. It keeps going. Not only does it start as we're asking to find him, but we keep on finding him. Isn't that amazing? What uh, some simple grammar will tell us in the scripture. And what this means is that we're commanded to make asking a lifestyle. Not only to ask to start with, but to keep asking. Not only to seek, to, to begin to look, but to keep seeking. Not only to knock, to begin to find, but to make knocking a lifestyle of grace. Which means, beloved, that prayer is commanded here to be part of our lifestyle. As much as watching the news in the morning or looking online or posting something to Instagram or TikTok, prayer is even more so to be part of your lifestyle. And, and, it, and the reason is simple. It's how God shares the joy of his glory and grace with us. He involves us in his mission to reveal his glory and grace. So, so it's not a duty as some are prone to say, prayer is a privilege because it's how God shares himself with us. And, and yet it's not easy, we realize, because God has to command it because we might miss it if we're not careful. Which is why this is such an important time in the life of this church as we're working on mission and thinking about how to share God's glory with a broken world because God is directing many of you, maybe most of you, to make a lifestyle change that will increase your enjoyment of his favor and grace and prayer in order to be missional. So if somebody asks you this year to be in a prayer fellowship or a prayer cell, practice with me. You say, yes. We'll try it again, only the preacher said it. You ready? <laughs> Everybody practice one, two, three. Yes, that's good. That's good. You're now a witness to yourself, right? A witness against yourself. Then Jesus here tells us two parables about, that help us understand a lifestyle of prayer. So that takes us to the second point, which is the how. Not only the what, but the how. He's calling us to be shameless intercessors. We'll find that in this parable. Let's look at verse 5. Put that up, would you? And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot give, get up and give you anything. And I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his impudence, because of his shamelessness, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, this is a pretty simple parable. There's three friends. There's a needy friend who's traveling. There's an abundant friend who's in bed. And there's a friend who knows both of them. And this parable is about the middle friend who knows both. That's the key figure, if you didn't figure that out. Now, in a Middle Eastern culture like we find in the Gospels, many places in Asia, certainly in India, if someone comes to visit you, even unannounced, it's your cultural responsibility to care for them. Now, in upper middle culture like most of us live in, we, we would believe that it's wrong for us to just show up at somebody's house unannounced 
Therefore, we release our friend from the obligation by never showing up. It's the opposite in a shame culture out in Asia and the Middle East. You're expected to go show up at your friends without even calling. You don't get a reservation at Motel 6. You, you go see your friend. And so if someone comes to visit you, it's your cultural responsibility to care for them, to let them stay in your house, to feed them, to do whatever's necessary to send them on your way. Hospitality requires it. And any need that they have is now your responsibility. That's the culture. Which means if you fail, that you'll be embarrassed and you'll lose honor, and you'll lose face, and you'll be full of shame. So the host, the middle friend in our story, is in real cultural trouble because he must help, yet he has no way to help. He has to feed, but he has no food to give. So the only thing for him to do is to find a friend who will help, but then he runs into another problem. It's also bad form to go to your friend at midnight to ask for help. In in India, the whole world shuts down at 10 o'clock and you don't go see your neighbor because in these places, in these culture, the kids sleep, there may be one, there may be five beds in the house, but they only use one. Everybody sleeps together in the same bed, kids with parents. And so he's stuck because either way, He's going to be embarrassed, and he's going to lose face. So it's a cultural dilemma. What would you do? Well, if he doesn't provide for his visiting friend, he's guaranteed to lose face. If he takes the risk and he goes to the friend that he knows has bread, he may be able to save face with the one friend, and maybe his generous friend Well, just maybe, hopefully, he won't care. Now, which would you do? Well, Jesus says that the man is impudent or or shameless. In other words, he's willing to take the risk in order to meet the need because the need matters to him more than his own reputation and saving face. That's what it means to be shameless. The cause is greater than than the risk of shame. He's willing to set aside his shame for the sake of helping another, for helping a needy friend. And beloved, that's the heart of mission prayer. We have over 40 staff now at ELI. I work for Equipping Leaders International. We train leaders in the gospel around the world who train others. I'm the India director. And there's over 40 of us now on staff and we're each required to raise our own support We have to raise our own salary, our own housing, our own benefits, and our own ministry expenses. I imagine it's true for the CO folks here as well. Isn't that right, Jeff? Isn't that true? Yeah. So a lot of people in ministry like this. So to be a successful support raiser, you have to be impudent. You have to be shameless. And I am. (laughs) So if you know me, You know it's so. I'm the best support raiser at ELI, probably because I have the least amount of shame. Or or maybe it's because I believe the most in the cause. It could be the other, right? You see, the dilemma I have as a support raiser is I can either lose face at home with my wife by not raising my support and sending her out to work my work to support our needs, to support my hobby as a missionary, or I can lose face overseas and say no to the many invitations that I get from India to do ministry and just say, look, I just don't have the money. I just don't have the money. We just don't have the money. Or I can lose face with friends and potential donors. Now, which would you choose? Well, I can tell you, I know that a lot of people who raise support in ministry, it's easier to disappoint your wife than it is to disappoint your donors, so you just don't do a good job. But I think the choice is clear. The only way I can do the ministry is to be shameless with generous friends. And I learned it right here from the gospel, you see. Almost 
every parable has a Jesus figure in the parable. In this parable, Jesus is either the needy friend, the shameless friend, or the generous friend. Let's take a vote. Let's ra raise your hand if you think he's the needy friend. Raise your hand if you think he's the shameless friend. Raise your hand if you think he's the friend with bread, the generous friend. Yeah, a lot of you didn't play. <laughs> That's a shame. That's a face shaming issue all of itself, right? <laughs> Beloved, Jesus is the shameless intercessor. Most Christians say he's the generous friend. He's the hero of the story. He's the shameless intercessor. That's what the cross is all about. He bears our shame. He intercedes for us in our place. Here's Hebrews 12 too. It's up on the screen. It says, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand throne of the throne of God. You see, beloved, Jesus loses face on our behalf in our place so that we can get access to God. He is the great shameless intercessor and he is inviting us, beloved, to be shameless with him and join him in intercession and pray kingdom prayer shamelessly and repeatedly for others. And to live a lifestyle of kingdom prayer, of intercession, and to not do some of the things that we might rather do in order to do for others. And the reason that we can say yes and the reason that we should say yes is that Jesus has already taken our shame. He gives us gospel power to be shameless intercessors because there's no shame for friends of God to repeatedly knock on heaven's door on behalf of someone else. In fact, we are commanded to do it because that's how the kingdom works. And the invitation to prayer is the invitation to pray the Lord's Prayer for the glory of God and his business and the good of others. And, and not just for your sick friends. You know, the number one request, if I ask for a request in the church, I've done it for almost 30 years. The number one request is for Aunt Martha's big toe. Or it could be something more serious like cancer. But it's still a health need whatever you call it. My, my friend John calls those organ recitals. <laughs> the number two request is for money. In India, it's for kids to do well in school because that's the way out of the caste system. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in, in the prayer line at church in India and somebody brings me their kid. Would you bless my child? They have an exam this week. That's a big deal to them. But what we're praying for is for those who need to know the love of the Father. That's the first petition. For those who need holiness and are broken by addiction. For those who are doing mission or need the courage to do mission. Or for five friends that you want to pray for to come to faith in Christ. Do, do you have a list of five? For those who are struggling to love mercy and to do justice. For those who have an evil eye towards generosity and want to hold on to their stuff. For those who are bitter and won't reconcile and are just stuck. And for friends around the world engaged in spiritual warfare that brings persecution. You know, my, my good friend Don and I, uh, we talk about the reconciliation prayer and we say, who's on your not lunch list? In other words, who is it that you won't go to lunch with? Hmm, you need some prayer, don't you, for reconciliation for you and that friend. We pray first about the Father's business and then our, about our business. We seek first the kingdom of God. That's the Lord's prayer. That's kingdom prayer. Point number three, the why. The how, the what, the how, here's the why. Because of the good, good Father. Look at verse 11 again. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, 
who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's another simple preaching technique found throughout the Bible. It's arguing from the lesser to the greater. In fact, both parables do this. They argue from the lesser to the greater. It goes like this. If you imperfect fathers answer the prayers of your children and give them good rather than bad, don't you think the perfect father answers the prayers of his children and gives them good rather than bad? Well, of course he does. In fact, your heavenly father does it more and better than you. If you have a friend who shares bread for others, don't you think that the father in heaven will do it? That there's not greater friends than the friend that you would go ask? That's the promise of prayer. Ask, seek, knock, because God loves to share himself with us and answer our prayers. He gets a kick out of it. It brings him joy as he shares his joy with us. So the question is, why are we not praying? Why are we not shameless intercessors? Well, if prayer connects us to the love of God and the generosity of God, why is it not the central aspect of our lives and even most of our churches? Even the traditional prayer meeting is gone in most churches, even in our denomination who hold ourselves out as the pure ones. Why is prayer so limited to illness, to these organ recitals? Well, I think there's two reasons. First, because of simple unbelief. We doubt God's love and his generosity. And, 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 and secondly, we think God and his mission is less interesting than, than sleep or YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or Netflix or Kindle or ESPN or work or kids or the many things that dominate our lives. Take a pick, make a list. If you're like me, there's plenty on that list. This isn't easy. The good things never are, you see. I had a friend in the hospital once, and I went to visit him because that's what good pastors do. And, and uh, after visiting him, I rode down to the lobby in the elevator with his aunt. Her name was Ann. And she was extraordinarily worried. So I'm not very empathetic, but I tried at that moment to help her. And, and I said, you know, Ann, this I'm sure of, that God loves our friend and your nephew more than you or me or anyone else. And she said, I don't see how. I just love him so much. I'm so worried. Beloved, God loves you. And he loves you more than anyone else does. And he loves you more than you could love anyone else. And it's a steadfast, never-ending love. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. If there is any doubt, just look at the cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross for his friends. He died to make us his friends. We were enemies at the time of the cross. God shows his love. This is what Paul says in Romans 5. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not for his friends, not for his family, but for his enemies, Christ died. He is the shameless intercessor. Why would any of us not choose to be in mission community praying together? It defies all that good. that's good. So if somebody asks you this fall or this winter to be in their prayer cell, what's your answer? Yes. Very good. Now the second reason, I said second earlier, I just meant first. The second reason we don't pray is because of internalized sin. Because of guilt, shame, or fear. If ask, seek, and knock is the holy trinity of prayer, then guilt, shame, and fear is the trifecta of prayerlessness. We can't ask because we're burdened with guilt. God's not going to answer my prayers. I'm not worthy. We don't seek because we're so full of shame. 
Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've said? Do you know what I've looked at on my tablet this week? God would never answer my prayers. We dare not knock because we're afraid of the God who will actually open the door and we'll get a beating instead of a blessing and we'll be swept away. That's what our flesh believes. But my friends, it's not true. Beloved, God invites us to prayer because of our guilt, shame, and fear. Only he can take it away. Run to him in prayer. Run to the throne of grace. And the Jesus figure in this parable is the son who gets the Holy Spirit. And Jesus shares his sonship with us and the Holy Spirit lives within us and we have access to a good, good father. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Now, for the bad news. If prayerlessness describes generally describes your life, then what you are missing is the joy, the joy of God's grace and glory as he shares it with us in prayer. You may be saved, you may be heaven bound, but if your life is dominated by other things like work or TV or kids or even church ministry, then that's where your joy will come from. And beloved, that's a tremendous burden. The burden of joy is overwhelming without a good prayer life and without praying with other people. Because the prayer begins, our Father. We're meant to pray together, not just by ourselves in our closet, but together. Notice, notice, you really gotta see this, notice that the timid intercessor, for the timid intercessor, the door is shut. But for the shameless intercessor, the door is wide open. And the bad news is, is that if sin and unbelief are keeping you from prayer, well then maybe you don't know Jesus at all. And that would be really bad. I invite you today to put your hope and trust in him. He'll take you to a good, good father who will hear what you have to say and answer your prayers better than you can ask or imagine. And that is the good news, you see. Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. Jesus died on a cross for our sin, even the sin of prayerlessness, even the sin of not being relentless to ask, seek, and knock. And he rose from the dead to give you new life and to share his glory and his grace with you and to give you the joy of his presence in mission prayer. And he will give you the power to pray if you will ask him and keep on asking him. So I invite you to renew your trust in him today. Ask him to make you a man or woman of prayer. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one prayer that God guarantees he will always answer No matter what, here's the guarantee. I didn't say it, Jesus says it. Is that if you ask him for more of himself, he will give it to you. It's right there in verse 13, we read it. He will give anyone the Holy Spirit who asks. If you ask God for more of himself, he'll give it to you. And the perfect picture of this answered prayer is the table that's right in front of us today because God is inviting you to feast with him in Christ. That's the invitation of the gospel. And did did you notice this in the text? If you're a believer, then the shameless intercessor already lives inside of you. Isn't that good? So what we're asking him to do is to strengthen us to turn away from our idols and to pray, to ask and to seek and to knock and to be like him and share in his glory as a shameless intercessor advancing the kingdom. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives inside of me. Beloved, if God loves you, really loves you and you believe he does, don't you? If God really loves you, what's the best gift he could give you? 
Well, he would give you himself. And he has. And he does. And he will. That's why we choose a lifestyle of kingdom prayer. And that, my friends, is the glorious grace of the gospel. Let's stand for prayer. Our Father, we're at all at how simple the gospel is. That we receive and believe. That we believe and receive. So would you fill our hearts with faith? So that we might be men and women of kingdom prayer. We know it's not easy, Lord. Our flesh hates it. The world cries against it. The devil causes us to doubt it. Ha! But your Holy Spirit, the shameless intercessor, lives inside of us. So Spirit of God, would you draw from us a new desire, a fresh desire to be on mission in prayer? And then would you glorify yourself and encourage us by giving us a multitude of answers? And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,